All right, good morning, everybody. I'm Bill Hamlet. I'm the Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings Magazine. And uh, I think this morning's panel should be one of the most lively and uh, interesting of the, uh, of the conference so far. Uh, before we start, I'd ask you to silence your cell phones. And also remember at the end, uh, Dave is going to open it up to uh, questions. These are always better when we have lots of good, lively questions from the audience. When you ask a question, please go to one of the microphones because we're recording and webcasting uh, this uh, panel discussion. Uh, so this morning's discussion is uh, titled Hyperwar. How do we develop and field the technology to win? We've got a great panel. Our moderator is Captain Dave Adams, U.S. Navy retired. Uh, Dave is a close friend of mine and a colleague from the Naval Institute. He uh, was a career submariner who commanded a provincial reconstruction team in coast Afghanistan. He then commanded the USS Santa Fe SSN 763 and the USS Georgia SSGN 729. During his career ashore, Dave served in several key billets working on experimentation and new technology in the Navy, including uh, as a member of the CNO Strategic Studies Group and the director of the Commander's Initiative Group at the US 7th Fleet. And Dave was a pioneer and proponent of railgun and helped to, starting as a lieutenant, push that technology uh, in front of the seniors in the Navy and convince them that this was uh, part of the future of the Navy. Uh, as an author, Dave has been published in Proceedings Magazine more than 25 times during his career. He also won, not, not top three, but won eight of our uh, essay contests over the years. Since his retirement in 2016, Dave served as the Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings. He was my predecessor. I, I owe him beers for uh, the fact that I now have that great job. Uh, he left us last summer and went to Hawaii. Uh, for a nice pay raise, and uh, he's now the director of uh, Western Pacific programs for oceaneering uh, and uh, works on submarine maintenance uh, out of Pearl Harbor and, uh, and in Guam. So, uh, Dave, uh, take it over, and uh, thanks for being here and moderating the panel this morning. Hey, Bill, thanks for that kind introduction. It's really nice. Uh, not sure it's warranted, but it's nice. You can see it coming. Just as H.G. Wells could see a nuclear revolution coming in the early 1900s, as he wrote in his novels. Today, we can see it coming. As I asked Alexa, as I was preparing for this thing, what is hyperwar, and she blurted off the definition that it is a artificial intelligence-infused, machine-enabled revolution where the human is removed from the decision loop. And as the wamba went across my living room, I could see it coming. You can see it coming. The members of this panel can see it coming better than almost anyone. We have, and I will introduce them separately later, Mr. August Cole, Mr. Amir Hussein, and Captain Sean Heritage. They have articulated it. They have been part of it. They can see this human revolution coming. It's not a revolution in military affairs, as Amir would tell us. It's a revolution in human affairs. And it's how that revolution in human affairs bleeds over into uh, the use of violence for political ends that we're really trying to get at today, that term we call hyperwar. So can you see it coming? Just as H.G. Wells saw it, we've seen it in the movies. We saw it in 2001 Space Odyssey. We saw it in Ex Machina. We see it in movies like Terminator. We know that it's coming. We can feel that it's coming. Can we embrace it? Can we figure out how to harness it? Can we figure out how to use it for human good and to deter wars rather than to have to fight them? Those are the major questions before us today. Those are the major questions before the panel. Rate me a bit of a skeptic as someone who's been uh, working innovation in the military for 31 years. Today, I struggle as I use my flip phone inside classified areas uh, to do work. Uh, how many of you have that problem? So we have big challenges ahead. Do we still remember the lessons of how, what it took to bring nuclear power to fruition? Could today's military tolerate a Rickover, or a Graves, or even a Wayne Hughes, those strong leaders with their idiosyncrasies who drove innovation? Can that happen? Um, just ask uh, Ed DeWinter, who's up front here, or Antonio Siordia. For two years, we worked really hard to bring innovation to the Seventh Fleet with some success, but it's really hard inside the current military structure. And I know all the defense contractors here know how hard it is. So we could talk about hyperwar, but how we bring together 
the community to deliver hyperwar for the benefit of the United States is a huge question. But also count me an optimist. The reason you should count me an optimist is because we're all here together, and it all starts here. People may not believe that, but there's a sign out there that says, victory begins at the Naval Institute. Well, victory does begin at West. It begins because of the conversation is happening, the open, honest conversation that the Naval Institute under the leadership of Pete Daly brings. And it happens because of the community, organizations like AFSEA under the leadership of Lieutenant General Shea, who are bringing people together to solve the problems. You have to talk about the problems, figure the problems out, and then bring industry together with the military. And that's what West is. So victory starts here at West, and we're really appreciative of the Naval Institute and AFSEA for this panel. So with that, I would like to introduce you Mr. August Cole. He really merits no introduction. He's written one of the best uh, accounts of what future war might look like in ghost fleets. He's a senior fellow at the Skrokov Center for Strategic and International Studies. He's director of the Art of War Projects. Um, he's really a known expert. He's been on television shows. He's written. He's reported on defense. And he's one of those key futurists who could tell us what it looks like. And that's why we're happy to have him. He has a BA from Penn and a master's in public administration from the Kennedy School. Uh, without further ado, Mr. August Cole. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, it's really an honor to be, as a person who makes stuff up, to be on a panel alongside such accomplished, uh, accomplished people. Uh, 190 years ago, by my liberal arts math, uh, Jules Verne was born. Uh, it's his birthday today. And he's an important figure for people like me who spend a lot of their hours thinking about the future. Uh, Ray Bradbury, who I think is probably one of the finest American science fiction writers, uh, said of Jules Verne, we are all in one way or another the children of Jules Verne. The ability to take really rigorous looks at the world around us and extrapolate that forward into marg magical inventions like submarines, like space travel, is the kind of opportunity that is ongoing, but there are also moments when it's increasingly relevant. And I think we are, again, at one of those moments, probably akin to like what we saw in the 19th century, where the power of the ability to imagine is as important as what we can accomplish technically. Uh, in part, I see this from the strategic point of view, which is there is really no reason to be surprised by anything anymore, because there are so many accomplished and talented people thinking hard about the future, not only in the ways that are accommodating the status quo, but of course in ways that are disrupting it. Uh, that, of course, includes the adversaries that are out there, from nation states to individuals. Uh, and so we have to always be, be mindful of that. I'm going to talk a little bit for, for a, a couple minutes uh, before I pass over to, to the other panelists about how we might see some of the forces at work, technologically and human, that uh, Amir ably uh, described in his, his hyperwar essay uh, in Proceedings. I think one of the really important things to think about when we talk about autonomy is that it's very hard to define and understand, uh, and not just for a layperson, but I think even in the technical community, there is a lot of conversation about what exactly it is. But I'm going to kind of brush that aside for a minute uh, and really lead, lead us down a path to think about the, the kinds of technological breakthroughs that autonomy might present the military may actually be really only crossing the Rubicon, if you will, uh, whether it's in a kill chain, whether it's in targeting during wartime that this is the sort of innovation that I think we're going to have a lot of trepidation about setting loose, so to speak, until we absolutely must. And that worries me because if we're going to be of that mindset, then we're going to miss the opportunity to think about ethics, to think about operations, to think about efficiency, to think about the kinds of ways that we can operationalize in the most effective way possible almost existential levels of, of innovation. You know, one of the ways that, that this is manifest today, of course, is in, in the cyber domain, electronic warfare. But you're going to see more and more of this entering into the realm, from my perspective, in not only defensive operations that are kinetic, but, but offensive too. And one of the constructs I've, I've come up with, and this is a little bit clumsy, so forgive me, but I'm an aspiring dog owner. We hope to re do a, adopt a rescue dog soon. And I was kind of thinking about the idea of autonomy being a bit like you're introduced to an animal and you're trying to get to know it for the first time. And in the way that we interact with our dogs, there are places where, for example, you can take your dog on the leash, off leash, in different times of year. Where I live, there's beaches that allow you to, uh, in the wintertime, run around with your dog on a leash. In summertime, it's no go. Yet you go in the winter and everyone's running around with their dogs off the leash. And it usually works out pretty well. 
a little nipping and barking occasionally, but, but everybody gets along. And, and the reason why the metaphor, I think, is important is that we're used to having a sort of dominance and control over our domesticated animals, but you know, these are very independent creatures that we are emotionally connected to. And I feel like that emotional connection to technology is really, really important. I was talking to somebody that works in the unmanned domain the other day about how they, how they felt about the, the, the thing that they worked on. And, and it wasn't love that that person felt for that, for that program. It was you know, a stronger, kind of more strident feeling of, of frustration because that's also another side of technology. We don't just love our phones. We also throw them across the room. <laughs> Uh, you know, by domain, quickly, I'm going to run through because I've, I've uh, had a machine cut me off there. Um, in the naval domain, obviously, you're going to see a lot of sub-hunting turned over to autonomous uh, systems using a lot of machine learning. But what if we had battle groups that were maneuvered, the ships themselves, by mesh AI? You know, really not just narrow AI, but almost artificial general intelligence, which we, which we don't quite have yet. Imagine that the very basic maneuvering of ships in combat, for example, was not something that a human entered into. Uh, there's some really existential questions around that for this service, the Navy, of which most of you here are uh, involved with, but also the other f forces as well. Um, I'll talk about some of the other domains during the, the course of the panel, but it's something I think a lot about in the same way that Jules Verne did uh, by using fiction to, to get at these issues. So thank you again, and uh, I'll turn it over to the panelists. Yeah, so I didn't think the alarm would actually go off well when I had the volume down, but it thinks that by it's on, it, on its own. That's a human uh, machine teaming right there. Yeah, poor human <laughs> machine right. teaming. So thank you very much, uh, August, and, and we'll, August will be able to offer a lot more. Uh, I'd like to introduce Amir Hussein, who's the founder and CEO of Spark Cognition. He was talking how this has gone in two and a half years, his company from one man in a PowerPoint to over 300 people who are working this very difficult problem of machine learning and AI-driven dri cognitive analysis. Um, he has over 50 patents uh, in his name. Some of them not approved yet, but many of them approved. His company won the Global Innovation Award in 2014 and the Nokia Innovation Challenge in 2015. He was personally the uh, Austin Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, and he is the author of a new book, which I encourage everyone to read, The Sentient Machine, uh, about these topics that, that we're talking about today. So there's uh, no better person on this topic than Amir Hussein. Amir? David, thank you so much for that very kind introduction. And I must acknowledge that the early work on the concept of hyperwar was done in collaboration with General John Allen, uh, who was the deputy commander CENTCOM and also commander ISAF. Uh, he's a dear friend and also a great thinker. So I owe him a lot in developing these concepts. Um, the idea behind hyperwar is actually to consider what happens when artificial intelligence fuses with the needs of um, the conduct of war. And this is obviously, this is something that happens across multiple domains and in many different areas. But one of the things that we realized early on was that uh, the relationship between intelligence and firepower is actually an inverse relationship. And what I mean by this is to say that over the last many decades, for example, as we prosecuted bombing campaigns in the Second World War, we found that we had to drop a very large amount of ordnance to take down a target because we lacked accuracy, we lacked intelligence. By the time that the Gulf War came around, we found that we could use a JDAM kit and transform something that was not very smart previously and was now very smart. And that one kinetic element could take the place of a much larger number of dumb, unguided bombs. Okay, so this is a very basic example, but in your military uh, discipline, you can abstract this all over. Uh, whether you watch somebody you know, exercise martial arts or whether you see a B-52 versus a, J a single JDAM being dropped somewhere, the principle that's working there is that intelligence and firepower have an inverse relationship. Now, why do I bring this up? I bring this up because in the age of hyperwar, one of the biggest changes that will happen is that decision-making will become federated inexpensive, embeddable, universal, uh, and also capable of collaborating in hive minds as swarms, ways in which decisions haven't yet been made, you know, in conventional warfare. 
So we can talk about weapon systems, and we can talk about the new Chinese AI-powered missile, and we can talk about what we'll do to counter that, and we can talk about where the gaps are and the S-400 and what we'll do to counter that, which, of course, we'll get into those things here uh, later on. But always keep in mind that the fundamental thing that's happening here is that the same size of force, if it could take X decisions previously, a competent force of some size could take X decisions previously, the injection of intelligence and autonomy allows that X to be multiplied manifold. And if the relationship, the inverse relationship between firepower and intelligence hold, then Artificial intelligence and autonomy, i.e. hyperwar, present opportunities the likes of which we've never seen. So for example, do you need to blow up a tank or can you fly into the barrel of a 125 millimeter gun uh, with a much smaller charge? If you had that level of precision and you had that level of uh, customization of payload, perhaps the latter would suffice in many cases. But these examples abound, so that's one aspect. The other aspect is not in the kinetic domain, it's actually in the information domain. One of the things that we've now got with the ability to make decisions so broadly and to automate these decisions is that we've essentially created a new domain, but the guys in the military haven't really created this domain. Really, it's the politicians that have created this domain, but now it exists, and that is the domain of your everyday information space, whatever you want to call it. Your popular media, things that the population in the country reads, and so on and so forth, what you post on social media. Artificial intelligence is increasingly being used to weaponize the data that's available publicly. It's being used to create profiles, to do very, very micro-targeting. In the book, The Sentient Machine, I talk about mind hacking. And uh, I talk about the need, for example, for AI shields. These are new classes of threats that are materializing because artificial intelligence has been inserted into this process. In these short remarks, I can't do justice to the full breadth of what the uh, implications might be. But, but then also um, think about it in geostrategic terms. Another aspect, another consequence of hyperwar, and we've written about this extensively also, is that it changes how we see the world. One of the principal ways in which we've evaluated the military potency of any country is, for example, the number of able-bodied citizens it can field and make part of a military. And that is also going to change. You see states in parts of the world that are rich, they have access to capital, they could put up dark factories, they could invest in roboticized factories that produce advanced equipment and goods. Uh, and those can now autonomously undertake campaigns. So you still need humans, but what's the multiplier? And what is the capacity of a country that erstwhile would not be able to field any significant threat, any significant capability, but with this dawn of hyperwar and the advent of AI technologies, those calculations change also. So I'll stop at this point, but my, but my opening remarks hopefully introduce you to three aspects. One, a very practical element of where artificial intelligence can make weapons much more smart than they are now and can decrease lethality while still maintaining effectiveness. That artificial intelligence is the principal means of the conduct of operations in an entirely new domain that the military didn't define, the civilians defined, the information space. And third, that the advent of hyperwar opens up a reinterpretation of our geostrategic future by allowing us a new framework and a fabric with which to look upon states that we have otherwise perhaps not thought of as importantly or some that we've given too much importance to. The framework is adjusted and therefore the rebalancing, at least the mental rebalancing now needs to take place. So with that, I'll conclude my opening remarks. Thanks, Amir. Captain Sean Heritage is one of the Navy's premier cryptological warfare officers. He served all across the globe in that capacity. He served as the commanding officer of Naval Information Operations Command, Pensacola, 
and as the operational commander of Task Force 1020, which is at the front forefront of uh, cyber warfare. He's currently at Defense Innovation Unit X, where he works uh, with industry to bring the military and industry together to come up with innovative solutions to many of the problems we talk about. He's a 1992 graduate of the Naval Academy and has a master's from Johns Hopkins and the Naval War College. It's my pleasure to introduce Captain Sean Hannity, Heritage. All right, thank you, David. Can you hear me? I can't hear myself. Um, over the course of this, uh, this panel, you're gonna notice that uh, one of us doesn't just quite fit in. As I look across the, the, uh, the panel, um, there's one thing that is very obvious to me that separates me from the, the other three, and that is I'm not wearing a jacket. So in order to re remedy that, and re acknowledging that I'm representing Silicon Valley, as well as the United States Navy, I'll wear my jacket. The now you're finally one of us. <laughs> yes, now I feel like I fit in. Uh, another thing that, uh, that, that you will soon realize is I'm not an expert in, si in hyper, hyper war, uh, but I do represent a team, uh, the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, that was stood up by Secretary Ash Carter uh, and still thrives today under the leadership of uh, Secretary Mattis. This is out there um, to acknowledge the fact that a lot of the innovation that is happening that we need within the United States military and the Department of Defense is being developed on the, in the private sector with very young startups that are very capable in ways that we are not. So we are all about partnerships. So much like my, my jacket represents that, that uh, intersection between military and the private sector, that is um, the mission of the Defense Innovation Unit. So rather than talk uh, deep about hyperwar, I wanted to share some thoughts about observations we are seeing in the investment of other nations in the area of artificial intelligence. So though our focus up there in, uh, in Mountain View is to focus at, on, on partnering with, um, with young startups to bring on um, AI expertise, both in the form of um, capability as well as expertise to help develop it, uh, most visibly with Project Maven, um, let's talk a little bit about what China is doing in the AI world. So they've declared their intent to become the world leader in AI with, by 2030, right? So should we believe that? Well, if we look at the fact that they've committed to $2.1 billion to develop an AI center, that's a rather significant commitment. Where's our AI center? Um, they've committed in their five-year plan to, to invest $150 billion in AI. Project Maven's a start um, but it pales in comparison to that. The magnitude of Chinese publications in deep learning exceeded that of which we are developing in the US in 2014. And I'd imagine that those two lines will never intersect again. Uh, their military civil fusion creates structural advantage for them over us. And as we look and see that their visible um, presence up in, up in the valley, and investing in virtually every AI startup. If you look at the makeup of the startups in, in AI arena, the, the, uh, the team is largely Chinese, or, or at the very least, very foreign. So I've mentioned that um, just to acknowledge that, just as Amir did, we are far from alone in, in our investment in this arena, uh, but we are not investing nearly as much. Our, the number of people that are focused on uh, becoming experts in this field are clearly, they pale in comparison as well. Um, so the other thing that DIUX represents and that, that we're very proud of is the fact that a lot of these foreign nationals, um, they may not have started their life as American citizens, um, but many of them are now, and many of them are committed to solving problems that are of mutual interest uh, in the public and private sector. So one of the things that I've learned in my short time, I've been on the team for six months, is the number of patriots um, of now Americans that are willing to, to share their knowledge and develop capability that we could not develop within our military and that we could not develop with traditional solutions. Not to diminish partnerships with traditional uh, commercial companies, but to acknowledge that our focus is that of growing the team, um, not in creating a competition between traditional partners and these non-traditional companies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sean. 
You know, one of the things that's interesting is in the last week or so, we've seen the uh, Chinese put the, a naval railgun to sea uh, and, uh, and operate that. Um, so that's very interesting how they're and across all fields that they are competing. Um, and that concept was also drawn out in the movies and in ghost fleets, uh, uh, imagining what that might look like, what that might be. So I want to give August a little more time to kind of extrapolate on the concepts you had in mind uh, that, we're, that we're looking at as it ties in with what Amir and Shauna said. A lot of the, uh, the, the challenges that we're going to face are internal that the adversary has an acquisitions track, a unified approach to some of these really critical technologies. But I think we have to be really clear, though, that if we want to make decisive gains in a strategic environment, as laid out, for example, and codified in the latest national defense strategy, we really got to take a really hard look at ourselves. Sean's work at DIUX is a really important part. But the defense ecosystem in the United States is as big as anywhere in the world which is both opportunity, but it shows the scale of the responsibility. So when you start thinking about challenges that we face, for example, like securing North Korean weapons of mass destruction sites, how are we going to go about that with the force that we have today? If we start to overlay autonomy in the context of what uh, the hyperwar framework has been presented by, by Amir, we start to think about the ways that we can assign roles to machines that we would have otherwise had to give to highly trained soldiers, Marines, sailors, airmen. That's not necessarily a novel concept. But the closer we get to those really high consequence engagements and contingencies, where there are consequences that are existential, the closer we're going to get to using these existential technologies. Uh, one of the things that I played with in a fictional context for this very reason was to use a sort of kill bot to secure a, a, a weapons of mass destruction site. You know, you can deploy a, a special operations command, you know, team, rangers or SEALs, but the proliferation of dangerous technologies in a country like North Korea, deliberately hid throughout in fortified locations, overwhelms what we can even accomplish with the forces that we have. So in the hyperwar context, then the question is, how do we go about doing that? Now, that's not a very sophisticated technology. I'm talking about those systems exist today. But the political will to do so uh, with forethought, not in response, is, again, part of that internal examination and re-engineering almost in the same way we'd examine a system that we have to do. Um, that, to me, is part of, I think, if, any, if anything that I would e explore in my fictional domain you know, further, it's really trying to understand process. Now, that's really hard to write a short story about bureaucracy. Uh, and, and heroes. But there was a reason in Ghost Fleet why we had a, a first generation American as one of the decisive players in, in the cyber campaign. Uh, there, are, there are patriots throughout the civilian sector uh, that may not fit the framework of, uh, of what the conventional defense industrial complex is associated with innovation, but we have this opportunity and responsibility to go much farther than we have before. Thanks. Amir, you know, in your work, actually trying to deliver hyperwar or technologies that enable hyperwar. What have you seen as some of the biggest challenges and maybe what is the biggest opportunity we have uh, to actually bring hyperwar to the field and the fleet? I'm going to try and talk really fast because there's a long list. Um, <laughs> but I, I have to say that uh, our partnership with DIUX, by the way, has been fantastic. And DIUX played a huge role in opening that first door. Uh, our partnerships also with Boeing and with uh, General Atomics have gone really, really well. And with some other um, you know, traditional uh, uh, suppliers that, that we'll announce here shortly. But coming back from all of that, let's just talk about what we're doing. So a lot of the technologies that people have sort of referred to as sci-fi, we're building them. So for example, we are taking commercial drones, off-the-shelf, inexpensive drones that we can buy in the tens of thousands and putting really lightweight neural networks on them to do recognition of an entire library of databases for tracking, for ISR, for targeting, for whatever you like. Uh, we are developing, at, at Softworks, we demonstrated an early prototype of a, a drone uh, magazine, which again takes commercial, inexpensive, 
throwaway drones that can carry enough of a payload to be useful in many different contexts, whether it's a non-lethal payload or a kinetic payload, and to be able to launch those uh, rapidly and to have a modular launch system that, that tracks all of that. Uh, the software that will, that, that will control all of these things in two ways. One, the swarming algorithms of which we've written extensively. Uh, we've published papers around that technology and how we believe that we can incorporate safety in those swarming algorithms by leveraging elements of the blockchain, for exa example. But then also going beyond that and providing individual <coughs> assets the level of autonomy that they need to break away from a swarm and then conduct some action. Uh, we've developed capability that fuses um, image analysis with language, natural language analysis. So for example, today if you have N drones, camera feeds, whatever your source of imagery is, uh, the job of an analyst is to look at all of that and to say, okay, I saw this and I saw this and I saw that and create basically text reports that are then studied, collated and put together to determine whether this was something of interest or not. To be able to automate that means that you've essentially uh, removed any bandwidth constraint from the number of such eyes in the sky or eyes anywhere you like that you need uh, deployed. Uh, we're working on that actually with one of the largest uh, suppliers of, uh, of drone systems to the government now, to the armed services now. Um, within that image recognition capability, there's there's tremendous opportunity on the cyber domain, artificial intelligence and cyber both for defensive and offensive. We have a product out today called Deep Armor that's totally machine learning based. It blocked all major zero day threats that came out over the last six months. Um, and the flip of that is an offensive capability that's available only to certain clients. But my point is I can go on and on and on. The technology of hyperwar is real. It is consumable in various different levels of readiness. It is consumable. I think the comments that were made earlier this morning at the keynote, the comments that I had the good fortune of making in Brussels to the Deputy Secretary General of NATO, and that, that I will go and repeat again here in, in the next month at the NATO summit, uh, the comments that I've made to former uh, Secretary Bob Work, and everywhere where I could find people that I thought have influence on this process, we've got to fix acquisition. There are many good ideas in this country. We've got the best universities still in America. AI was born in America. We still have the largest number of AI researchers in America. But if you let these ideas die on the vine, what's the point? Uh, that is a disconnect that needs to be resolved. DIUX is a huge step forward in that. SCO, huge step forward in that, but more. There's more ideas than there are organizations with bandwidth to take them somewhere. And as somebody that represents industry, uh, but really more than that, I, 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 I could probably take the technology that we have in different areas, and we do. I mean, national security is one of our areas, but we also have financial services, which is a reasonably large business for us, and also energy and uh, industry manufacturing, which is a reasonably large business for us. But I care about national security. This is a key focus. I spend a lot of time thinking about this, and I'd like for it to succeed. So I think... One area where we do need some help is figuring out some guerrilla mechanisms to get this, the, this acquisition business taken care of. Uh, once we do that, I think we'll have a leg up. As Amir points out, the key is that lash up between industry, because we all know that industry is far ahead of the military. For the first time kind of in the military industrial cycle, uh, you know, the labs used to lead all the innovation, the, the government labs, but today it's all led by industry and the amount of investment um, this industry is putting into the technologies which can be fused together to bring around a hyperwar. They're just way ahead. And DIUX was a, one of our efforts to bring that together. Sean, could you talk a little bit about maybe some of the lessons from that that we could expand to do what Amir's talking about? Absolutely. So I, I was here yesterday listening to a panel on this very stage. I listened to Secretary Hondo, uh, this, Gertz, uh, this morning as well, and there's a lot of talk about the acquisition and how it needs to change. There's a lot of talk about culture and how it needs to change. And as I look around the room and just the fact that you people are here today, I'm sure we're not talking to you. We're talking to the people who aren't here. Um, so the question becomes, how do we as leaders at our very, representing our various teams help others get what we already see? And how do we scale um, the culture that we represent how do we help others who have the positions of authority 
to, to leverage the authorities that we have already been granted uh, for the greater good. Uh, yesterday, there was a significant talk amongst the, um, the three stars about the risk aversion versus risk management uh, and the fact that our contracting community has been wired to, maybe due to us and their conditioning, wired to um, not accept any risk. So DIUX is but one um, organization with OT authority. Um, we're not the only one, uh, but we're going at it in a creative way, a totally legit way. We're not bending any rules, uh, but fortunately the NDA has given us some authorities that, uh, that allow us to deliver things much more quickly than otherwise. To give people reason to want to do work with business that, or do business with the DOD that would normally afraid to, the barrier to entry was too much. So to me, I think the, the, the real lesson that we've learned is that it is possible that we can move rather quickly um, and that we need not be the only organization within the DOD operating the way we are. So 2018 for us is the year of scaling to help others do what we do so that we are not the only ones who do it. So other people have these very similar authorities they may be going about leveraging, leveraging them in a very different way. So that's one of the things that we intend to do is to help coach others, to partner with DAU, to help educate those who are uh, uh, running the processes in the acquisition world, to acknowledge the fact that they can do things a little bit differently. And those who dare to take, the, to take responsible risk, that we promote them and incentivize that behavior as opposed to the, the same old behavior that's going to generate the same old results and frustrate all of us. Thanks, Sean. So I hope that that uh, kind of sets the scene for everybody about what Hyperwar is about, the technological opportunities and challenges we're facing. But we really want to answer your questions at this point. So we have microphones in the back. We'd, we'd love to take your questions. Sir, may I ask a question? Absolutely. Uh, Ron Fritzmeyer, uh, I'm the chief engineer at Spay War. I love this stuff. If you'll let me tell you a little story as part of my question. Um, a couple years ago, supporting uh, NAVC as part of trying to figure out how to drive cybersecurity into the fleet so that it's actually change in the fleet posture, right? Um, the uh, then commander of Spay War made a really great statement. We can change anything in the Navy in 30 years. <laughs> so the, the question I have for the panel, and it's, it's more just sort of maybe in the form of discussion, is the, the notion of innovation and understanding opportunities for bringing technology in to, to potentially fundamentally transform some of what we, uh, what we can do in terms of the naval mission. Great. We absolutely want to do it. I mean. Every day, I certainly talk with my folks, how can we move faster? How, how can we make processes easier while maintaining the technical rigor, right, so that we address the risk, we manage the risk? Totally, I'm, I'm totally there. I think, in general, actually we are. It's not just the acquisition process, it's also how we integrate it into the fleet that we have today. What, what we can't do is just throw away what we have today and create a new thing, at least not for the most part, right? That's just not fiscally real. So I'm really interested in what do you see as some of the other opportunities to go beyond? It's, it's kind of like in the classic O&R uh, sense of the valley of death. Great idea, getting it to a program, the gap in between is like infinite, right, in most cases. What are your thoughts on things that we can do to try and drive that gap to close it so that we can actually bring some of this incredible capability transformative into the Navy sooner, faster? Thank you. I'd like to give each of the panelists a little of opportunity to, um, to address this very quickly, but it's, it's clearly the, the, the challenge, right? Uh, three years ago, the Commander's Initiatives Group did PandaraNet. We put more bandwidth on Fort Worth than the entire Seventh Fleet, but we can't bring that to the fleet for a number of reasons. So how do we get there? I don't have the answers, but let's let Amir take it first really quickly, and then we'll pass it down. I'll give you a really tactical, sort of a practical answer. Um, you know, we worked with, uh, actually with, with uh, NAVC, and developed a 3D model of uh, the bridge of an Arleigh Burke. And the idea there was not just to say, now you can wear virtual reality goggles and you can see what the bridge looks like, but the idea was one of a completely virtual upgrade of the ship. 
So the system that we put together, you wear the, the glasses and you see all the instrument panels where they are, but they're no longer showing you the visualizations that the current older systems show you because all of the computational layering of the actual experience that goes on top of that panel now is being replaced in virtual reality with different pixels that are coming from an out of band, completely upgraded system that may or may not even exist on the ship. Any upgrades to information systems using virtual uh, uh, reality can be trialed. You can bring in AI prognostics for systems by tying into the SCADA that you do have on the ship by adding wireless sensors in certain areas. For example, we've had multiple turbine failures and three turbine failures, uh, three pump failures last year that resulted in LCS and Zumwalt incidences. All of those were basically failures that a sophisticated AI-based vibration and analysis system of which we build them for large turbines could have, uh, could have dealt with. The problem is you go in and you talk to NAVC and they say, excellent, wonderful, but it takes n amount of time, n number of months, whatever, to actually put that on. So it's got to be stick on, it's got to be interfaces, virtual reality, there's got to be a lightweight, here it is. And with that, you actually in increase capability, not just from a maintenance perspective, but also from a survivability perspective. Because the bridge now exists in the virtual world. All the instruments are virtually connected. As long as the connectivity to the physical systems is, is maintained, you can be anywhere, and you can don this, uh, this uh, visor, and you can be on the deck, uh, on the bridge. So that's a survivability capability also. Uh, point is, there's lots to do, and the answer isn't rip and replace and hundreds of millions of dollars for every upgrade. We can be a lot smarter than that, a lot smarter. August, did you have a comment on that? Yeah, a quick one. I, I think there's an element of advocacy that is important with two constituents that are not necessarily addressed on these kinds of issues and that maybe don't really understand the stakes for very short, the long-term stakes for very short-term uh, and, and, and understandable reasons. You know, one is, is Congress, uh, which plays an important role in accommodating failure in programmatic, right? However, there are ways around that, not just direct outreach, but Secretary Gertz this morning talked about almost taking a more appropriate scaling of the designation of an acquisition program, taking everything out of the ACAT1 concept down to lower threshold, uh, lower attention, models of management and that may be really effective because it might allow people to stay below the below the, the surface so to speak but I do think that there, you, we can't do enough to educate the congressional community about the long-term risks if we botch this really pivotal moment in technological defense innovation and the second is the investor community when uh, a small company engages with a venture capitalist. They are looking at liquidity events down the road, thinking about how to ramp up as much revenue and hopefully profitability as possible. And doing business with the Defense Department from people who I've talked to, uh, and, and Amir can probably speak to this as much as anybody, uh, there are big trade-offs when you do that. Uh, the other is the large institutional investors for our biggest public defense companies as well that have very, uh, prior, very different priorities that you know, force management and boards to think really short term. Uh, the system works that way, but that's really going to hamper us if we can't make the kind of long-term investments. So those aren't necessarily about pipelining a given technology or given innovation, but unless you kind of clear away that brush, you don't have a clean shot at, at making it. I was struck by Amir, you know, talking about wireless sensors and the things that we could do, and then I was like, man, if we try to do that, the bureaucracy is going to, the cyber defense bureaucracy of what he described is really going to shut us down really fast. So, Sean, can you speak to that? Is there a way we can get past all the controls that we have on cyber defense in order to actually do an AI-infused hyperwar or some of the things that Amir talks about? Well, absolutely. We, we, we control our own policies, right? Um, but it's all culturally. Culturally. So we talk about projects that we do at uh, DIUX. It's really projects that we do anywhere. They have to be all of three things to succeed. They have to be operationally desirable, they have to be technically feasible, and they have to be organizationally viable. Um, our approach is to not worry too much about the organizationally viable piece just yet, and to get people to buy into it over time once we prove to them that it's possible. But, sir, to your question, um, we've out of the gate, there's, there's four of us full-time Navy folks at DIUX, and we're trying to create opportunities to solve problems with and for the Navy. 
We focus first and foremost on spay war out of the gate. And one of the challenges that we have is that, you know, we are held back by what some deem to be organizationally viable. So whether it's cybersecurity, we, we don't want to take it responsible risk, we want to take no risk. So I go back to my, my last job where I was the commanding officer of Navy Cyber Defense Operations Command and the mandate to operate our network as a warfighting platform. Taking that very seriously, we oper operated in such a fashion that we minimized that risk. Um, if you look across the fleet, we are not doing that. We are accepting, in many cases, irresponsible or unknown risks. So we have to find, find that balance and hold ourselves back so we are responsible, uh, but, not, but to acknowledge the fact that if we are totally risk averse in the cyber domain, then we're not going to give our teammates the tools that they need to do their jobs. If I may just toss out, the, the fleet is very supportive right now of us trying to get into, I'll say, more experimentation. And I think that might be a piece of this issue of how do we drive experimentation faster where we're helping to manage some of the risks while we're learning, hey, this is really the mission value of some of these capabilities that you're talking about. So I look forward to more discussions later. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir on the left. Thank you. My question is about capturing the imagination of the bureaucracy. Um, and I'd like to start with an example of DIUX and how they've captured the imagination of the Marine Corps. Um, so I, I'm Major Brandon Newell with the Marine Corps. I lead the Autonomous Vehicle Proving Grounds right here in Miramar. Uh, Qualcomm right now is doing testing of their autonomous vehicles. Um, we don't care about their IP. We care about their deep market forecasting about how that emerging market will, will come about and how we can intercept it. So it, some of that started with DIUX. Um, working in uh, air taxis. So Joby Aviation was one of their contracts. In September, I went to uh, deep into the training area of a Central California base, and I watched 35 young engineers every day living in a tent, working for Joby Aviation, flying their platform over and over and over and over. And the FAA was there the same day that I was there. FAA gave them their experimental license to go back to Santa Cruz and fly because it, the, the opportunity afforded to them by DIUX to fly every day in restricted airspace that FAA would not allow previously. And so we see bases as this asset, not just for ourselves, not just for operations, but for the state, for industry, especially in autonomy and autonomous vehicles. So capturing the imagination and AI of what we can do today, that's my question for the panel. Thank you. I'll take a go at that as the person who writes science fiction stories. Uh, you know, I think it is a really proven tool to engage much broader communities than you might otherwise with a, a given concept. You can prototype with fiction when the stakes are low, right? This is imaginary. You can connect with people who are not necessarily going to be ready consumers of a white paper. Uh, when the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab was looking at its uh, strategic environment forecast, they decided to work with the Art of the Future project on creating science fiction vignettes for that with the express intent of creating a document that could be relatable uh, and accessible to much more than the wonks who, who crank away trying to figure out what the future is about. So, so that sort of experimentation and permission to take those kinds of steps I think is really important because the imagination now and the, and the possible, uh, technologically speaking, are, are ever closer linked. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll just add that in my uh, actual experience, uh, we've seen this with the special operations community, where we've been able to, to run some ideas by them very quickly at Softworks. And now we have a number of people saying, hey, when can I try this in a field trial? Uh, and that's really valuable. It goes beyond just the use of the base. It actually goes to the use of a training exercise, the kind of validation you get from there. And really, we're interested in end user feedback. Just like with any product development cycle, it's useless until the end user finds value in it. So that, to me, is a very positive sign. And certainly, I'd love to see more of it. On the aerial autonomy side, it's a little bit more complex. Uh, and you've just given me a good idea, so thank you. Uh, that might be something to pursue. Uh, but, but the uh, special ops guys have, have been helping us in that way. Yeah. Sir, your question on the right. Thank you, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you for your time so far. 
Uh, John Dietenhofen, uh, United States Marine, currently in a retired status, and I'm currently with QTech Solutions. We make software, long-time software makers, for not just uh, obsolescence management of electronic components, but also um, anti-counterfeit. And uh, this is to Mr. Cole. I will tell you that uh, regarding fiction, I mean, your Ghost Fleet novel has absolutely generated a tremendous amount of dialogue uh, within our community. And this actually speaks more towards the actual feeling of technology. Uh, one of the conundrums that you brought up was the fact that 78% of all components or all microchips produced for one of our fifth generation systems were manufactured by a potential adversary. Now, somebody who's keenly interested in this sort of thing, in your research, what have you found of ways you could potentially best secure the supply chain to prevent such a hardware hack? Well, it's a really good question to ask a liberal arts major. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, the book has been effective in creating almost a safe space to have a lot of those really hard conversations about supply chain uh, vulnerability in industry as well as government. So I think just the very fact that you can get two sides of the equation talking about the same risk without recrimination, uh, without uh, anything that is sort of bureaucratically driven fear is important. The notion of trusted foundries, of course, has been around a long time and it's something that is really practically very difficult but may be necessary. Uh, the technical side of things, again, is probably better spoken to by someone who has a, a stronger engineering understanding than I do. But there is a realization, though, that this is an issue. And I would say finding that solution, and this may sound a bit simple, but starts with that, that common understanding that this is no longer a niche issue. If you can use a fictional product, a film, a book, a video game even, to start to have a level set understanding about where there's a blind spot that we just aren't checking because it's a too hard problem or it's bureaucratically unpopular, because nobody likes to bring bad news to their boss. And this is a way effectively to do that without necessarily creating the kind of ire or anger that, that gets in the way of a solution. Because these are our solvable problems. We do very hard things every day in this country, uh, great things that are, these are not, these are not unsolvable. And, and, and I think uh, if we found that the only way to secure the supply chain is to build everything that we import from the East uh, here in the US, then we're in trouble because that's a long running process and there's a deep integration of that supply chain. So where I find that we need to invest our time and energy, uh, luckily uh, the work of Claude Shannon is an example uh, in front of us. And in information theory, the assumption is that when you transmit a message across the channel, the channel violates the message in some way. So we know for decades in computer science mechanisms and algorithms and mathematical guarantees that can be provided on top of known bad components. From distributed systems, we know about, for example, the problem of the Byzantine generals. There are numerous such uh, constructs that allow us to build systems with untrusted components. That's an area that we should become the world's top experts in. We build the safest glue. The low-end componentry that fits into that glue uh, will either not be fully trusted or you might get lucky and it works fine or for redundancy purposes, in any case, you want to look at it differently. But there's an entire area here of putting together untrusted components into trusted systems using information theory, using distributed systems and so on and so forth. And I think that in many cases, one can intuitively see the solution. In some cases, perhaps you would have to think more. But in many cases, you can see the intuitive solution, and I think that's an area of investment for America. It's a strategic area of investment. Just a quick reminder that the, quick, the quicker you get to the question, uh, the more questions we'll be able to take and the better answers our experts will be able to provide. So I'll turn to Captain Retired uh, Sam Tangretti back here, who I know will uh, sh show us how that's done. I think hyperwar is dependent on electromagnetic, use of the electromagnetic spectrum. If I am an anti-access power, the thing I want to do is deny the use of the electromagnetic spectrum to anyone. So my question to you is, can we really burn through that? If I'm North Korea, I don't want to use my nukes to strike cities, I want to use it for EMP. Because I know the entire construct you're doing requires the use of the electromagnetic spectrum. So tell me, can we burn through what our opponents, smaller opponents, will inevitably do? Sean, you want to take the first one? No. Nope. All right, you're, you're up. <laughs> okay. Uh, so there are ways to uh, prevent that uh, uh, issue. 
Um, so we've done quite a lot of thinking around this. So the first item, of course, is that these assets, many of which are components in a hyperwar, are small. Uh, they might be autonomous UAS type systems and so on. Uh, and in fact, even in the context of the dreaded um, domestic scenario where some nut flies a, you know, a quadcopter with a grenade into a stadium in that kind of a situation, think about what protection we have uh, today. We have, and I won't name the vendors, but basically we have RF rifles, right, and, um, and a prayer. You basically hold the rifle up, and if the range is exactly right, you get to jam the drone, and if the drone is one of those commercial drones that's defaulted to, f to land when it can't get a signal, then God willing it'll land. But that's about what we do today. Uh, that's obviously not sufficient. Now, how would you counter that? One way to counter that would be to obviously have uh, a very lightweight Faraday cage structure so that somebody from the, from the, from the ground that's attempting to block uh, an RF signal that that drone is receiving couldn't block it. That's a simple little hack, very inexpensive. You can prevent that. Uh, uh, potentiality. The other thing, of course, is to have autonomy on the drone because signal loss is not an issue in an autonomous drone. So that's a second layer of protection. And you go on and on, and I, I won't provide a blueprint, but you go on and on, and there are many ways in which you can create uh, protection against these sorts of uh, you know, attacks. So. Uh, that Faraday cage comment that I made for a small asset, even in an EMP scenario, with no need for ongoing access to RF, even visual cues that allow a swarm to operate the way it's supposed to, or even perhaps acoustic cues that allow a swarm to operate the way that it will, will allow us to uh, deliver capability even in an EM denied environment. This is my view. Okay, I, I want to uh, answer that in a little bit different way. You know, part of the way that, that I've been thinking about this question is that there is a lot of variation in the problem, and that's regional. You know, in Europe, uh, a very dense environment with large cities that are concentrated, nations that are squished together, you're going to have a different approach to network warfare than you will in the Pacific. In the Pacific, it may be a zero-sum game where the way to dominate is to deny everything, to take the grid down. Again, we played with that in Ghost Fleet. But, but what about continental Europe? You know, the fight there may be to keep the grid up, where information operations could be as crucial to achieving success in a mission or a larger campaign, because your truth can break through in others. And th there's a lot of discussion about cyber, about electronic uh, warfare as also being a fairly button push activity. But there is a tactical component to it. It is not a bloodless activity. And I think we're going to see that uh, more and more. And I think we need to appreciate that risk and sacrifice that those kinds of missions may call for. Uh, it's something that in fiction I think is really important to try to understand because it takes people a bit beyond their assumptions about a technological solution and realizes that the reality is going to potentially be far more, far more difficult than that. Yeah, on the topic that Amir was talking about, about autonomy, there was a proceedings article in June, Trust the Autonomous Machines by Commander Phil Mar Purnell. It flushes out some of those issues, but, but will we be, be courageous enough to trust the machines, to build them correctly, to give them the, the information they need and trust them to go out there and fight a war? At the same time, at the lower end, how important is keeping that network up? in order to do the whole set of irregular warfare that comes with conflict. So, so I think those are interesting questions. Do you have a question for us? Oh, no? Okay, let's start over here on the right. Yeah. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Elliot Schroeder with Chassis Plans. I'm also a reserve battalion commander. Uh, my question's, I'm sure you're all familiar with the dreadnought effect that happened over 100 years ago. Is there something in hyperwar, whether it's AI or some other tech, that is a dreadnought technology that will obsolete everything? I don't believe it yet. Um, and remember the dreadnought effect, the key operative word there is effect. Um, you know, there's some news now that the Chinese have deployed artificial intelligence on their boomers. Uh, and path planning, avoidance, uh, sensor integration, potentially weapons control, who knows? It's opaque, uh, one doesn't know. Uh, that that could be uh, offloaded to AI. So, well, something like that. You know, that's, uh, that's a candidate for the dreadnought effect. Uh, but uh, personally, where I am, I'm watching all of this stuff very, very carefully. 
I don't think that it exists yet. However, I think that large-scale autonomy, swarm-based autonomy, is the most viable, punchy uh, way to deliver these capabilities today. Uh, I am, I'm not even talking about the information space. That's a whole different game. A non-kinetic information impact of AI-based systems can be monumental. You can potentially tear uh, countries apart without even firing a single bullet. But uh, on the kinetic side, I do think that where we are with small swarms, highly coordinated, uh, with enough intelligence in a single asset to take over parts of the mission, which is the new kinds of swarm algorithms that, that, that are being developed that we're working on, and I think that's really where it is at the moment. If, if it turns out that what the Chinese are saying is true, and there's a fully autonomous you know, nuclear boomer going around uh, with avoidance algorithms and fire control and identification. And I mean, that's, uh, that would be quite a revelation. There's a, there's a corollary to that, too, which, which you alluded to uh, in the hyperwar essay and, and even in that answer, which is the decision-making speed of machines is going to eclipse what the political uh, and civilian control over the military can accommodate. Uh, we see how much trouble we have assigning blame for the hacking of the 2016 elections, and we're gearing up for another in November that will certainly see similar interference, perhaps with different objectives. You know, uh, well, rather the same objective being chaos, but the methods being different. I should say. Uh, I think that's a really profound risk in all this that has a a, a, a sort of cautionary, uh, unappreciated factor to it that we don't really want to confront either, is that our system is not actually set up to conduct hyperwar as it is, not even in the, in the uniform military domain, but in the political and civilian world. I, I think we would really struggle to grapple with that, that actually being executed. Yeah, my view is that um, hyperwar technologies are so dispersed, you know, from what I talked about, Alexa, all the way up, that it's very difficult to see how they come together in ways that are a revolution in military affairs or that human affairs. But reality is, when you think about it, if it do, and we don't can't exactly imagine it yet, there's definitely that what you talked about. There's definitely a, a huge change. If we had autonomous robots out there fighting wars, completely divorced from the network, uh, and somebody would, it was able to muster those and unleash those, or even <laughs> micro robots to do those sorts of things, you may get that 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 huge change in warfare. So I think it's it's out there. We haven't clearly defined it, but when you take the the scope of the change that's going on. Uh, we, have, we better keep thinking about it. Yeah. And Admiral Daly here reminding me of the moral and ethical implications, which are, which are huge, but other people may not be constrained by those moral and ethical implications, and we may not have the opportunity to uh, think about it as they unleash those uh, technologies against us. <clears throat> Heather Henson, uh, I want to thank you so much for this panel. It's made my three days here worthwhile. I have a startup in San Francisco, we're nine people. And uh, <clears throat> we spent the last two years in a room focused on the math of facial recognition. And now we've uh, put this camera together with an NVIDIA chip and edge processing and neural networks and AI, and we can see faces hundreds of yards away. And my, the reason I wanna thank you is because the acquisition process is tricky. And, uh, you know, when you're sitting in a startup in San Francisco, you're not quite sure who to talk to, and I've uh, emailed DIUX, and uh, I'm sure I'm gonna hear back soon. <laughs> 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 but I, I look forward to that coffee. And uh, so I just wanna say thank you. I think I'm the only startup here. Over the last three days, I haven't seen anybody like me, and I look forward to, um, you know, seeing more of this, but somehow getting the startups here. I'm thank all you. for you, and Amir's thank you for startup. fighting the good fight. <laughs> you know, I, yes. will, I will say, in, in addition to that, that uh, the CNO is hosting a small group right now with a couple other startups that we've been doing business with as well. So I'm, I'm happy to say that you are not alone, but I am happy that you are here, and I look forward to that coffee as well. Yes, sir. Your question. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. I'm uh, Lieutenant Commander Craig Allen. I work in the Office of Counterterrorism, Coast Guard Headquarters. Um, so the, uh, the theme of this conference is, is great power competition. And certainly when we talk about the technology that enables hyperwar, we tend to think of the, uh, our, our, our peer rivals, uh, China, Russia, et cetera. However, one of the things that we've seen, um, especially recently, is that the technology that uh, is kind of at the leading edge now will inevitably uh, proliferate to non-state actors. And we've seen in Syria 
non-state actors launch a sophisticated do-it-yourself drone attack on conventional Russian forces. Um, we see drug trafficking, drug trafficking organizations uh, taken to the undersea domain. My question is, what are the implications of some of that leading edge technology today when it gets in the hands of non-state actors who maybe can't be deterred in the same way that our state actors can? Thank you. I want to take that first because it's a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, if we only focus on great power actors, and it, it is our cultural pre predisposition to do that in the military, uh, we're going to miss a whole threat set from hyperwar that ranges from the insurgent with a, with a UAV and a sensor all the way up to that. And we have to focus on the whole scope, and that really does concern me, uh, like you said, those, that irregular warfare. And even worse, if we only focus on the high end of warfare of, against Russia and China, uh, we'll end up getting our, getting our butts handed to us by them in other ways, like in the South China Sea, in the Crimea, in the Ukraine. So it's that full spectrum of what the implications of this are that we really need to address. I'll, I'll just do a real quick response and, and pass no, the please, mic, so please. to speak. But I think that a lot of the technological possibility you know, discussed on the panel today can, can of course, aid war fighting, but it can radically improve resiliency. Uh, you know, and this is a bit of a pulling the thread on the chips question. You know, if there, if there are, are ways we can think about the known problems we have and accommodate them using the tools that we're just imagining today, then our vulnerabilities to those actors are going to decrease. And so I think you can use the same sorts of mindset that an adversary does, not for destructive purposes, but for constructive ones. Yeah, and again, uh, I completely agree with uh, both the comments that you got. Again, at a, a, a very tactical level, um, you know, what we don't have, for lack of a better word, is an urban safe close-in weapon system. And uh, I've had this discussion with my friends in law enforcement in Austin, for example, which is where I'm from, and I live there, and I'm a UT alum. Uh, if you're familiar with UT football, it's huge, and Darrell K. Royal Stadium, <laughs> Darrell K. Royal Stadium seats 100,000 people, and it's all open. Uh, I was recently in Las Vegas, unfortunately at the same hotel, just a few weeks prior to that very dastardly event that occurred where that individual shot, killed so many people from a window. I had that same view um, in just two weeks prior to that. And I, as I was sitting in the window, you know, you, can, you oversee McCarran Airport. Uh, it's a clear view. And you can see the planes coming, and they're pretty slow, and they take off, and they're pretty slow, and they're lined up for a long time. And there's hills around that. And I was thinking, oh, my God. You know, there's, there's, peop there's gates and there's people and there's checking of IDs. But if somebody were to fly four Walmart drones with some incendiary packages, I mean, it would be, a God forbid, a disaster. So those threats we aren't tuned to. So the kinds of threats you're talking about, it's not even that we aren't well, we aren't thinking about them and we aren't building for them because you can't take a phalanx uh, you know, system and deploy it in, the, in, on, in Austin, downtown. You know, it's how big it, you're going to take, take more out than just the drone. So you know, those are the kinds of specific systems. So um, if, you, if you'd like, I'd be happy to take this offline with you. We wrote an extensive paper about the gaps. So urban safe CIWS, detection capability, how do you have to do very large scale uh, swarm engagement, what are some of the ways in which you can do multi-domain denial and so on and so forth. Uh, happy to share that with you if you like. Yeah, that'd be a great, thank you. you know, I think Amir just hit on a, a very important point, right? So the, the problem that you're identifying, I mean, we came here together for three days as the maritime services. But the problem sets are much bigger than us. They're bigger across services. They're across the federal government. They're across the world. Um, so out, out where we work, the, uh, the process starts with a problem statement. And what I think would be a very healthy thing for all of us to do is write down some problem statements that we, that we see that we may not have the responsibility or the authority to solve. That, that may not be problem statements that the Navy, the Maritime Services, have by ourselves. Uh, your example about you know, life out there in, in Austin, I think, is spot on. Uh, we've been given a lot of thought to uh, security in uh, stadiums. It's not a problem for the United States Navy. It's not a problem for um, the DOD, per, per se. But the applications you, you see, as you've articulated, can't transcend anything that we are directly interested in. Thanks. Okay, so we're coming to the close here. So we're going to take one final question, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Lieutenant Commander John Tai, Combat Information Systems Officer on USS Boxer. 
My question goes to how do we overcome the inherent resistance associated with the way we've always done it? I know in the panel the other day we had all the three stars at the table and they all talked about we need to acquire faster, we need to improve this process. Captain Heritage, your comment about getting rid of the length of requirements process, establishing a profit statement and going from there was spot on. However, and down at the unit level on the ships, we're ready for newer technologies. What we've got, we recognize, is already years old. We're building more and more Arleigh Burke class destroyers. We've got over 60 of them. The generations, the eras of building new classes of ships, bringing new ideas, new ways of doing things, it, we're having problems with it. You look at that with the Zumwalt class, the LCS class. How do we get past that legacy of the way we've always done it? In our service members in the acquisition core, every three, five years, they rotate out. But a lot of that middle management, the folks whose jobs rely on that program that's been there for 30 years, that significant resistance to slow roll until that uniform member with the great idea is now gone. How do you get past that, sir? Well, I think we've all, all of us have been experimenting with that over time. And I'll, I'll reference a, a nice article written by a colleague of mine, I think it was on the Naval Institute blog, that of the frozen middle. Um, that we see, and I, I commented on it yesterday, I had a nice conversation with Admiral uh, Becker, that you, see, you line this panel and all of our senior leaders are saying this, the right things. Right? People like you represent th those who are inspired by their words. The challenge is just as you had articulated the, uh, what's happening in the middle. So if you look around the innovation spectrum or the creative problem sol solving spectrum, you see the, the Defense Entrepreneurs Forum. You see the Athena Project. You see these grassroots things that are the Navy, Naval Constellation. You see these things happening on the fringes. At the same time, you see the CNO's Rapid Innovation Cell disappear. You see the Strategic Studies Group disappear. You hear conversations that the Navy Innovation Advisory Council may not be long. So it's these mixed messages that I think are confusing a lot of us. Um, and I think giving people, re giving people like you reason to think maybe there's not a place for me in our Navy because I am, though I am inspired by what my senior leaders are saying, I'm not getting the support I need at, well, not, I won't say at the local level, but, but in the middle. So I, I guess that's a long way of saying I don't have the answer, but I, I, please consider me a partner as we try to break down these barriers. And I think what, what SCO, what DIUX, and what others represent, um, you heard the question this morning about should there be a NavWorks, like, like a SoftWorks. Um, these things are popping up, but they're popping up on the fringes. We need to make them part of our organic chain of command. I don't know about you guys, but for me, this has been a fascinating panel. Um, I've learned so much uh, from all the panelists as they've talked about the questions. And I would just ask you as you leave, we'll stay up here to answer any questions after we close out. But uh, what's been great about this is that victory does start here at West. It's about the conversation uh, led by the Naval Institute under the leadership of Admiral Pete Daly. It's about the community and AFSEA and uh, General Shea all together uh, we can solve all the problems that we're talking about, but it starts with the conversation, and we really appreciate all you being here to join us in that. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Dave started off by saying you can see it coming, and I think uh, this conversation and the questions and the discussion uh, have, have helped to focus you know, what we can see coming in terms of artificial intelligence and the future of warfare and some of the dangers and risks inherent that we're all going to have to uh, uh, address. So uh, Dave, August, Amir, and Sean, thank you for your insights, for your time, and for your imagination today. Uh, to thank you, we have a, uh, an AFSIA bookmark and a Naval Institute book. Uh, the book is called Limiting Risk in America's Wars, Air Power, Asymmetrics, and a New Strategic Paradigm by Phil uh, Mellinger. Uh, thanks, and uh, look forward to the conversations, the kind of sidebars that will happen after this. I think many people in your audience aren't going to let you uh, uh, leave uh, shortly here. So uh, thanks again for being here. Thanks for your, your kind, uh, your insights and your imagination. It's been great uh, being part of this panel today. Thank you.